Um, our next speaker is Dr. Connie Millar. Connie is um, a scientist at the Forest Service Pacific Southwest Research Station, and her, her research focuses on uh, California and Great Basin ecosystems. But she says her resource management and decision support frameworks have acclimated, uh, they can be applied throughout <laughs> Western ecosystems. She has a PhD in genetics from the University of California at Berkeley. And she um, she's, uh, most recently was one of four principal investigators of the Westwide Climate Initiative. She leads a research team that addresses responses of subalpine forest to historic and climate um, uh, impacts, uh, impacts of climate change on American pika and rock glacier response to warming climates. Um, Thank you, Darren and Barbara. It's a joy for me to follow Julio because I always feel he has the capacity to put all that complexity in such clear languages in a way I could never dream to. And I'm also an historic ecologist. I work on the far western side of the Great Basin in the eastern escarpment of the Sierra Nevada of California and the adjacent ranges. But I've spent much of my career also working in science management partnerships. And it's so to that side of my work that my talk today addresses. And it's interesting that Julio ended his talk by speaking that maybe the challenge for restoration is enabling the West, because I was going to say my talk is less about restoring the West, it's preparing the West. So that may be the new challenge for restoration itself. What I'm presenting is an overall conceptual framework then, which I have derived with my colleagues from interacting with resource managers on the ground of how to address incorporating climate into management operations, both planning and project management. We've found that increasingly managers are interested in incorporating climate, but are often a bit confused or overwhelmed by the amount of information that's coming at them and unclear quite where and when to start. So we're hoping that this framework is a bit of a guide. At the highest level, as you likely know, there are two main categories of addressing climate change in a management standpoint. The first are all those set of actions that have to do with adaptation. So how can we assist our ecological systems to prepare for uh, the coming changes and challenges that climate brings? And those are what I'll address today, our adaptation strategies. The other are those set of actions that uh, lead us to mitigate or reduce our human effects on the climate system. Fortunately, these are often complementary, but there certainly are cases where they're conflicting. So I bring to you some lessons from the projects of a group of colleagues of mine who have been working with the Western Research Stations of the Forest Service. And most recently, we have something called the Westwide Climate Initiative. It's a what we call a toolkit project. And we're trying to address this question that we hear from managers all around the West, which is, what can we do in response to the kinds of challenges that Julio has described for you previously? Our goals are to develop regional downscaled bioclimatic assessments that are of relevance to managers on the ground. This is primarily the work of our colleague Ron Nielsen in PNW. And then the things that I've been involved with with my other colleagues have been case studies where we go primarily to national forests but also national parks and we interact with the managers there, we see what their challenges are, what their ideas are, and how we might help them to bring about tools that are useful to accommodate these non-stationarity issues that Julio has described. And finally, to develop strategic and tactical resources for managers. By adaptation tools, this is what we mean. So it's a pretty broad definition. All those resource management practices, educational modules, decision support aid, qualitative and quantitative models that will help and be relevant to incorporating climate into management. So at the highest level, some of the lessons that we learned are this. We think it's good news because it seems that about 80 to 90 percent of the thinking, which derives from ecosystem management, was a relatively new philosophy in public lands management since the 80s, is valid. And this is, I think, empowering to managers because there's this sense that things are so different. Will there be real paradigm shifts? And certainly in the challenges that Julio brought, there need to be modifications to the way we think. But really, there's a lot of this kind of philosophy that can still be used 
modified with new information, tweaked where necessary about priorities and the way we interpret it, but still the basic principles are upheld. Some may be entirely inappropriate, and I think you heard from Julio that context where they would be, where we rely on historic variability or stationarity as targets, and maybe restoration has the most to grapple with in that regard. Focusing on managing for process and ecosystem services becomes ever more important, trying to figure out what that means, rather than for desired future structure or composition, which tend to be more static. And of course, uh, we find increasingly that the need for close relationships between the science and the management community, it's always been important, but ever more now. We've also found that there's often a sense of there's so much uncertainty, there's so much change coming, that we just can't do anything. A lot of times there's a sense of feeling like a deer in the headlights, uh, but there's a lot that can be done. We're, we're trying to bring this message of hope rather than despair, that we can act even in the context of uncertainty. So what I would do is put a bit, a bit of a framework, and there are a few steps, and this kind of matches some of the things that Jean Chambers mentioned yesterday. So you'll see some parallels, but again, I'm speaking more broadly than in a restoration context. So what we've learned from the managers is that here's sort of a way to approach uh, incorporating climate and easing it into their, their universe. So first of all, starting with reviewing. And this is the important step. It's what we've been doing at this meeting. Review the literature, review the models, and importantly, review monitoring conditions. Review what's happening on the ground. As here you see Dr. Grayson's back and Dr. O'Connell discussing what's happening out in the Great Basin. Looking at vulnerabilities, and then ranking them. We need to really set new priorities and new, dis new priorities and, and look at our capabilities for dealing with these new priorities. And then finally, after that kind of background, resolving treatments, resolving decisions, and then moving forward into application <coughs> and monitoring. So I just want to go over those steps. The review case. What, what I find most managers are clamoring for are these regional downscale models. I think there is the hope that if there are models that apply to their area, they will then reduce uh, uncertainty and have more of a sense of what to plan to. So it's like a future range of variability rather than a historic range of variability. And so this is just an example of one downscaled set of models that Ron Nielsen has bring to the Inyo National Forest where I work in the Eastern Sierra. These, uh, I think, are important as giving a general trend at larger scales, say the physiognomic province scale, or the state level, or large landscape scales, about long-term trends. But there's a concern, I think, about feeling that these really might def def define the future, predict or forecast in the areas that managers are actually working. It's very important, and I think we all know who are ecologists and, and scientists on the ground, managers on the ground, that at, at these project scales, complex climatology really rules, especially in mountainous terrain of the West, where areas can be driven by processes that are not well incorporated or are not resolved at these regional downscale models. So things such as on the right here, cold air drainage, which is um, only recently being understood at the landscape scale, Chris Daly, at OSU has been a leader in that. So what you're seeing in that map of the watershed in Oregon is the blue is cooler areas, and they're lower. So that's a positive lapse rate. And it's not just big playa basins like we think of inversions in the Great Basin, but over landscape at much more micro scales. So this understanding of heterogeneity at local scales, how that's going to interact with changing trends over time, is extremely important. That's where the rubber hits the road for managers. And there's some sense that with the changing global circulation patterns, there'll be more of this kind of inversion condition, such that the net actually might be cooler conditions at lower elevations than at higher elevations. So these are the sort of complex processes. And we're actually finding, I'm a forest ecologist, and we, of course, are looking at tree line moving. And one of the things we actually see is that lower tree line is moving down. And in some of the lower elevations, there's more recruitment than has been in the past, and I think it might have to do with some of these colder drainage. Part of reviewing is anticipating and planning for surprises. Some of these hopefully won't be as much surprise if we get more predictability, such as Julio's talking about. But we can learn from what's happened around the West and 
anticipate that it might be in our labs as well in whatever region that you work. So for instance, we're seeing more subalpine forest mortality as bark beetles are able to move up slope into areas that they haven't historically for the last several centuries, causing landscape scale mortality there. We're seeing that for the first time in the Eastern Sierra starting in about 2007 with white bark pine. High elevation fires too, those landscape scale fires rather than just a single tree burning. This um, sudden aspen decline, which we heard a little bit about yesterday, uh, we, we just don't see that yet in the eastern Sierra, for instance. I think not in much of the Great Basin, but coming, likely, or maybe, maybe not, but it seems to be climate related. These are the kinds of things we can anticipate, linder wildfires. So one of the things we've done in this Westwide Climate Initiative is launched a website, which we address specifically to public lands resource managers. And of the myriad resource uh, websites that are online, we hope this is uh, more relevant and it eases the way as a portal to information that's relevant. So the second uh, step then is to rank, uh, once you've reviewed projects, reviewed, uh, is to rank priorities. And we've learned from decision makers that there are three main areas where they find they can incorporate climate in their planning and decision making. Uh, it, one is to actually take no action. And that may seem like head in the sand, uh, but it's uh, actually defensible if there has been a clear priority setting exercise and one decides that there are certain sets of projects that just don't need to be addressed yet or in a particular um, ranking. So these might be things where our resources are not very sensitive, not vulnerable, and not needing attention in the short term, or by contrast, they may be overwhelming and there just isn't resource capacity to deal with them. Most often we find that managers incorporate climate thinking after disturbance. So after a fire, maybe there's planting with new species mix. And that makes sense because uh, both in the short term, like after a wildfire in the longer term disturbance, as Julio was saying about decadal variability, <coughs> these are when ecologic traje trajectories are naturally reset. So work with nature. Here's a chance to accommodate change. And finally, there are plenty of opportunities to be proactive and work in advance. Setting priorities really need to think about short and long term. In the short term, like projects that are ongoing, and Forest Service we call these the schedule of proposed actions, the SOPA list. Um, but we might also reconsider goals of projects that are ongoing at the present. So here is an example of a kind of old school management for endangered species on the Inyo. This is an exclosure for a species of concern, Astragalus monoensis, and that species is supposed to stay in the fence the area. And of course, it, it wasn't doing it um, in the, sort of the old days before, before we thought about uh, change, but certainly not now. So it's moving out of that. So this, this is what I mean about more managing for process. So reconsidering whether that kind of an approach makes sense or not is, is a first step. In the longer term, it's where we really start in the planning process, trying to anticipate the changes that are coming, easing the transitions that we know will happen. I like to liken it to a parent raising a teenager. We know the transitions are coming. They're probably going to be hard, but our job as parents is to make it as easy as it can be. So we've developed some tools for ranking and priority setting, just one example. Again, um, following up from what we were hearing yesterday, which was a much more detailed uh, analysis of aspen health, we've developed a survey for a sudden aspen decline, which again, we haven't seen in the West, it's already in the Sierra Nevada, but it's really, we're trying to uh, help the inventory focus on whether the different health issues in aspen might be presaging sudden aspen decline and then that would help the managers know where to set priorities. We've developed something called a climate project screening tool, and that is uh, we take this SOCA list, Schedule of Proposed Actions, we go to the responsible manager, and we sit down in a kind of interview fashion, and we discuss the project that's planned. <coughs> These are usually out-year projects, and we talk to them about climate trends, we um, ask them whether they think it still makes sense to do the project, even with these trends coming. Then we ask them to write a narrative in the blank column there about what, what they think the project relative, relevant to those trends might be. And then they make a decision about whether to continue, to stop the project, or to modify it. And it becomes a very important thinking exercise, thinking device. And it's also an important part of the project file <coughs> for any interactions with uh, constituencies. There are a number of approaches to priority setting that have been developed that are helpful for ranking. 
It's these tor- tiered approaches, win-win strategies, where the things that we do that are beneficial for climate are also beneficial for other resources, such as prescribed fire might be useful for both. Um, I like to speak of the piggyback priorities. That's where I see a lot. That I watch a decision maker thinking about climate change. In the case of Mammoth Lakes here in the Eastern Sierra on the right, the forest supervisor has a very high priority for working on fuels management around the town in the WUI, the Wildland Urban um, urban Interface. And he said, well, this is where we will prioritize our aspen treatments. So there's a sort of piggybacking of climate priorities. Triage is also a, a, a way of dealing with exigencies. It's often thought of popularly as a sort of crisis reaction. It's really a very formal approach deriving from civil defense and military situations where urgencies are greater than the capacity to respond. So it involves a kind of sorting of projects, and so that's not unsimilar to other priority setting methods. But in the case here, the difference is that there's some situations that are considered very urgent but are untreatable because resources aren't available, and you put those aside. And that's a very scary decision, but sometimes it's the right one. So finally, the resolving, uh, we've, we've ranked, we've reviewed, and now we resolve treatments. And there are, the highest level here we find is that a toolbox approach makes the most sense. And by that I mean there's no single solution, of course, for incorporating climate. Each situation is different. We have to mix and match tools, ranges of options for the short and long term, and encouraging more than ever flexible and innovative opportunities. We really find that we're a decision uh, where supervisors are supportive of experimenting, then these ideas get put forward faster. We've also found that the role for scientists in this uh, inner dialogue is not bringing the answers. There's often that sense of, well, what do we do? Tell us. It's very much in dialogue. We bring this information, like we've heard in this conference, and many of the solutions are given by those who know how to apply them on the ground. So I have a range of tactical approaches, and these are where you might see some similarities to Jean's talk, coming from the more conservative to the more proactive. At one end, there really are situations where we want to protect and defend resources against change. So it's using the term resistance in a little bit different way than a restoration context. But there are situations that are either very valuable or they're critical links that we might be able to, to have an effect. So the example I give here is um, Mount Pine Beetle, where in British Columbia it had been held back on the west of the Continental Divide by cold temperatures. As temperatures warmed, beetle made over the Continental Divide into a forest that it hadn't been in the past. It's now in fact in, in both the lodgepole pine and also relative jack pine, where it's acting like an exotic and has a chance to spread across Canada. So had we been able to stop uh, bark beetle from moving across the divide, that would have been an example of resistance. Also, a resistance strategy is to develop climate refugia. These are areas that we understand from paleoecological research to have been places usually remote and disjunct where species hunker down and hid out during periods of climate variability. We can broaden that concept. There are many kinds of places where species might persist. And I don't just mean general reserve strategy, but areas where there is, for instance, we heard from Duncan Patton yesterday, climate buffered or more climate resilient, such as uh, riparian areas. Areas certain substrates tend to hold species longer, such as carbonates. Uh, areas where there are hot, steep elevational gradients, where there's a sort of runaway or escape opportunities, might be designated as refugia, and so on. Resisting the effects of, of changing climate might be possible only in the short term, though, of course, because kind of like putting your finger in the dike, there's some decisions that might not make sense. In the Sierra, there's a lot of effort to remove conifers that are recruiting into meadows. I don't like to use the word invading. Uh, as, as a sense of keeping the meadows meadows. Similarly, one might think about that in the PJ expansion treatments. Or in the west slope of the Sierra, there are on, on all the forest plants to reintroduce salmon into historic salmon rivers. But the fisheries biologists are saying the water temperatures may be too warm in the future. So it might not make sense to do that. Promoting resilience to change is the most often heard um, adaptation strategy. By that, we mean improving the health of resources such that they're able to withstand and resile back to prior conditions. Ways that we can treat are through any ways that reduce stress. 
Resilience also is perceived as the ability of a system to absorb the onslaughts brought by climate or other challenges and remain in the same basic state. So any actions that keep a forest a forest and not convert to a shrubland, keep a meadow from converting to forest, or keeping species from extirpating, those would be considered, considered resilience treatments. Working with disturbance, uh, as Julio was emphasizing, that the synchronization, the homogenization that often happens, we want to develop diversity as a means of greater capacity for resiling. We can encourage structural diversity. We can encourage adaptation to change. So these are ways of working with dis with diversity, with um, with disturbance. Considering alternative germ germplasm options is also a, a resilience approach. There's been a lot of discussion about that. New planting mixes, perhaps after disturbance. My early career was in genetic population genetics, and I spent much of my time developing these small seed zones and very strict seed transfer guidelines. Now I might suggest shaking up the pot a little bit, perhaps 10% of the seed from adjacent regions. I'm not big on moving seeds directionally, but these are options to consider. Assisted migration is a relatively controversial treatment. I'm wary of it myself. The idea is moving species to where we think they might do better. Here's an example with Brewer spruce, which is a rare species of Northwest California. It burned down in one of our research natural areas that was set for Brewer spruce, and there was discussion about whether to replant. And the quote there is by a genetics colleague who suggests there'll be, the models suggest there'll be no Brewer spruce habitat in the lower 48, and that we should move it to British Columbia and start planting it there. I have a very hard time believing there won't be Brewer spruce habitat. Maybe as an adjunct treatment, but I'm concerned about assisted land migration. Promoting connected landscapes makes a lot of sense because movement is how species adapted naturally. Public lands have a lot of checkerboards, so there's this very fragmented management. The more we can collaborate, work together, interagency, agency, private landowners and such, the better chances we have to enable species to move. Realigning systems is the way I like to think of restoration. So rather than going back to the past, how can we tune our systems so that they are capable of adjusting to the future? Example I, I use is from my own landscape here at Mono Lake on the Eastern Sierra, where Los Angeles started diverting water from the tributaries in the 40s. Uh, court order was to restore the water to the lake, and rather than going back to the 1940s water level, they developed water balance models that took into account the kinds of uh, variability, drought, and tried to set a lake level that would accommodate that future um, climate condition. So in summary, if we look at a kind of overall framework, the way that we can start to hang some of this information that we've heard in this conference on a skeleton, what we, re we recommend is for managers to review, to rank, and then to resolve into a toolbox of planning options where there are a lot of R's here, aren't there? Developing resistance, increasing resilience, assisting the response, and realigning ecosystems. Thank you. What is the role of historic analogs, periods that are similar, perhaps, to where we're going in the new thinking? I didn't mention it. Um, it's being asked, and so where, what is the adaptation community thinking about that? I think it still plays a very important role, but in, in my mind, it's more for understanding the way species respond to change, rather than to look at conditions and mimic them. So I have worked a lot in the medieval climate uh, medieval climate anomaly period of a thousand years ago or so, and to me that is a good analog, but more for the way we might be seeing species react there. So species moved uphill in some senses, others didn't, there was breaking up of community structure. 
in, in, in the bigger picture, if you go to American Geophysics Union meetings, for instance, you'll see them using the Miocene and the Eocene as analogs because they were high CO2 environments. So I think at the general level it's still there, but less as a structured target. Would you agree with that? Would it be fair to say that, that, that an analog for the process of Good. I like that. Okay. Yeah, that's good. More. So I'll repeat that question if I can get to the core. It was that managing for resilience is probably where we're coalescing as the most important, I would say at least short term, because I think it's a bit naive to think we can hold, you know, again, the finger in the dike in the long term. And if that's the case, then should be reevaluating re management methods uh, that determine health, since that's what we're trying to improve. And yes, I think absolutely. I, I actually, and perhaps I'm less familiar with range management methods, but I think that the tools are, by and large, pretty good. They just are not informed by the right science. And that perhaps if they are then, uh, we look at the situations where they have worked well, so they've actually uh, restored or regained resilience, and after fires we've had the, we've been more resistant to cheatgrass coming in, then those would be the, the right tools. But there's some situations where they're inappropriately applied because it's, um, there are other interacting stressors. So I, my own sense is if, if there is enough information about what we might expect given climate change, that those tools can still be used. We don't need to throw the toolbox out. Would you agree with that? Um, I think it depends on the, which tool exactly. I don't think they all need to be thrown out. I think they need to be revisited with more interaction with, with scientists. So maybe it's this fresh look that's so important. It's keeping their eyes open. Julio wants to come in. I think one of the things that I worry about in terms of increasing resilience is this whole idea, as Tony just pointed out, in sticking our finger in the dike. And so I'll give you two examples. One is the National Fire Plan, where we spent about half a billion dollars reducing fuels, you know, reducing uh, tree densities, for example. Um, and, and go, along with that, we spent probably over $100 billion in the Joint Fire Sciences Program uh, developing new science to aid fuels treatment. Um, and so the focus was, in fact, in reducing fuel densities and trying to keep these systems from, from burning and turning over. Um, on the other hand, you've got to think that maybe the climate is changing along the predicted ways. Uh, that down the road, one of the things that we may have actually done is just kind of held these systems back. And I would have, 10 years ago, actually, almost a dozen years ago, I argued that joint fire sciences, for example, should have been focused on how we manage the products of succession, since nature is going to beat us with a punch. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a little leery of increasing resilience because, in, in a sense, um, it's going to keep us from actually dealing with this system as a moving target. And in fact, we may be aiding that system to, to uh, shift abruptly, uh, to, to cross thresholds uh, much more catastrophically by increasing resilience. And I, I know that this is kind of a semantic game, but I'd just like to raise the point that increasing resilience isn't, particularly at the subcontinental scale, isn't always 
a way to go. That we really have to learn how to manage the products of succession. And if we're going to learn from historic analog process, what we do learn is that there are these dramatic changes and that systems do ratchet. So I think that it, it really is naive to, to consider resilience in the long term for some systems. One last question for Connie. When, when we talk about resilience, I, mean, I, I think of things as, such as the ecosystems and grasslands where we converted from a diverse system to a simple system, from a complex ecosystem to cheap grass. And that's what I'm thinking of resilience, how we can increase the resilience so that the uh, communities might be more adapt adaptable to change. Is that oh, absolutely. And I think I hoped I was meaning that by that second slide about um, resisting a change in state, and so I would say going from a diverse community to a homogeneous community is a change in state. And the extent that we can work with disturbance to, as, as you in the Great Basin do so well, to try to resist the invasions of exotic species, then that's uh, an example and would probably will be stabler for the longer run.